So I'm going to show you how to get dressed in uh, late Victorian style, uh, late Victorian, early Edwardian, around 1897 to 1904-5-ish. Um, so I'm already wearing my shift and my drawers. I'm not going to lift this up any further, just to spare your eyes. And um, my, my boots. Um, Victorian and Edwardian women would put on their shoes and socks first because once they put on their corsets, uh, they <laughs> couldn't get down to, to their shoes and socks to fasten them. So the corset comes next. Um, it is very easy to get into yourself. You just got to close up the busk. It's this front part. Um, and then tie it or tighten it in the back. If you can find this cord. Um, there are a lot of misconceptions about corsets, um, some being that only wealthy women wore corsets. That's not true. There are records of corsets being ordered for female inmates at prisons and insane asylums. Um, there's also just this idea that corsets are really torturous um, and uncomfortable and painful but that is also not true as you can as you can see i am not at all uncomfortable or in pain um right now and uh you know people women again of all social all social strata would be wearing these so you know housemaids and washerwomen really couldn't afford to wear something that was uncomfortable and painful um because they, you know, they really needed to be able to devote themselves to working. So, um, you know, the corset was really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's meant to provide back support, to provide bust support. Um, it's not meant to be a torture device, and it wasn't. So here I'm just tying the, uh, top of my shift and a lot of my corset kind of sits sideways. Um, now time for the petticoats. Depending on the era you could wear up to 12 petticoats in the 18 early 1850s. Wealthy women would wear up to 12 starched horsehair petticoats. Then in 1856 the hoop skirt was invented which meant they only had to wear one or two petticoats just to smooth everything out. Since I'm doing late 1890s, early 1900s, um, the, the silhouette was very, st more streamlined. It was, was an hourglass, but the skirts were um, A-line. So I will be wearing three petticoats to um, kind of just give a little bit of shape and volume, but nothing, nothing too extreme. Um, I'm just going to tie these and you'll notice I'm tying them slightly below my waistline so I don't add any bulk to this area. Um, like I said, these, these weren't torture devices, but you still did want to look, look your best. And then the third petticoat. There's also a, a misconception, I think, that it, it took hours and hours to get dressed. And as you can tell, I'm already about halfway dressed and it's taken me five minutes. Okay, so the next thing to go on is going to be the corset cover. This is essentially just a camisole. Um, and women would wear this to kind of hide any hard or rough lines that their corset might give them. Um, it was also to protect it. That's inside out. It was also to protect the outer dress from the corset. If any of the bones were to poke through, they would kind of get the corset cover and not the outer dress, which is more expensive. Um, and also, if 
you know, if your shirtwaist, which is an old fashioned word for blouse essentially, if your shirtwaist happened to be made of lighter, slightly see-through fabric, you could wear one of these. You would wear one of these, rather. Just buttoning this up, I'm gonna tie it. Forgive the uh, modern ties. Oh, that's long. Um, forgive the modern ties. I do, um, it's the best I had. Original ribbons tend not to last. Um, and this was the only replacement I could get at short notice. So now that all of my underwear is on, I'm going to put on my shirt waist. Um, this is Let's see, it's a pink and white pinstripe. Um, Shirtwaists tended to be pretty simple, um, usually white, but they could have a bit more ornamentation on them, like this one. Um, you can see it's got kind of puffy sleeves. That was very fashionable at this time period. And it does just button up down the front, like so. And now for the skirt. Skirts also tended to be plain and dark colors. Um, black, blue, this one's gray. All were options, but skirts were not, did not tend to be incredibly decorated. Their, the point was kind of for them to be simple. And they would be floor length. Um, I, I take that back. Depending on what you were doing, if you're more of a middle class woman, say you're a stenographer or a seamstress or a librarian, then you'd probably wear a floor length skirt. If you are doing more manual labor, if you are a um, servant uh, or something along those lines, your skirt would be a little bit shorter. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with the button. Um, and it again also depended on the era. In the 1880s, skirts tended to drag on the ground, but in the 1890s, when germ theory started to be understood, skirts shortened. Um, so they didn't quite drag on the ground, and that was because there began to be this fear that um, women's skirts dragging on the ground would brush up against horse manure and that they would bring fly eggs into your pristine Victorian house. So skirts came off a few inches. So um, now my, my skirt is on, um, but it was very popular in the late 19th century and early 20th century to wear a sash or a belt. So I'm going to put this on and it fastens very tightly around the waist. It fastens very tightly around the waist. So I need to use this button hook. It's a shoe button hook. So we use it to button up your boots, but it also works for things like this because this is difficult to do with just your hands. I'll back up. Turn the sash. And um, also, you see here, and I hope you can see here in the back, the button of my skirt is visible. So what I'm gonna do is pull the sash down and then take this pin and just pin it here. I'm not stabbing myself or anything. Just kind of going through my corset just to keep that down there so it will hide the button of the skirt. So now I'm dressed, just some uh, bling to go. So this is called a chatelaine purse or a chatelaine pocket um, and it would be worn here at the waist line like that so you could put your handkerchief or some coins in there or whatever you needed. Um, I'm going to wear a 
It's called a jabot, a bit of lacy ruffliness at the neck was very popular in the late 1800s. Um, and I'm going to pin it on with this brooch, which is made out of scarab beetles, or also called dung beetles, um, which is a decidedly less flattering name. But this was popular during the Egyptian revival, this kind of this style of brooch. So they were popular in the 1830s um, through the 1840s and 50s, and then they kind of had a resurgence in the late 1800s. I did a very poor job of that. I might need a mirror. There. Um, oh, earrings, very important. Lots of Victorian women wore earrings. These are just very simple silver abalone. Um, another accessory that was often worn was the lorgnette. This is sort of like a pair of, of glasses, but they're not prescription, it's just kind of a magnifying glass. So there's a little, this little knob here, and when you pull it down, this, oh yeah, they pop open. So you can, if there's, if you're reading something and the print is very fine, you can open that. It's just essentially a little magnifying glass you wear around your neck. So, I'm now dressed, ready for my day. I only need to put on my hat. Pinned on, of course, with the handy hat pin. I'm just gonna stick the hat pin through the hat, through my bun, hopefully not stabbing myself. And then another one for security purposes. And, ow, stabbed myself and my parasol and I'm ready for my day.